This program contains graphic images and discussion of medical procedures. Viewer discretion is advised. These are uh, my disclosures. So we already heard a little bit about the uh, uh, IRAD registry, and this is some data from the IRAD registry just looking at uh, mortality of aortic dissection. And we know that there's a big distinction as to whether or not you have a type A with arch or ascending involvement or type B. And if you have a type A dissection, 30-day mortality is quite high in the range of 60% if you just treat those patients medically. And surgery is the... Uh, uh, is the treatment, and you significantly reduce the 30-day mortality in type A dissection with surgical repair. Now, type B dissection is kind of the opposite. So with uh, surgical therapy and all comers, most of these are complicated type B dissections uh, uh, in this, represented in this graph, but the mortality is 30% at 30 days, and medical therapy looks to be superior for type B dissections, particularly in uncomplicated uh, uh, patients. So if you look uh, overall, uh, uh, just to summarize, the 30-day mortality with type B dissection is 32% in that early IRAD uh, data. Medical therapy was down at 10%, but there was an interesting small group of patients who underwent endovascular therapy, presumably for complications, who did have uh, mortality that actually approached that uh, or were similar to that in the medically treated patients raising the question very early on, uh, would there be benefit to treatment of type B dissections with, uh, with endovascular uh, interventions? But I think what's really important when we type of, talk about dissections uh, is that it's not just an acute disease. Uh, a significant problem of this is that it's a chronic and a long-term disease in these patients. And so if you follow those patients who survive those first uh, uh, 30 days, mortality is still about 25% at three years. 50% of patients will rupture or require repair of their aorta within four years, and there is progressive aneurysmal dilation in a lot of these patients with an average, particularly in the false lumen, with an average false lumen growth rate of 3 to 12 millimeters per year. Now, we have some of the data from TVAR and some of the clinical trials showing relative safety with low 30-day mortality and instead stable and absorbed trials in those patients treated with TVAR that we can induce false lumen thrombosis and some favorable remodeling. So there's some positive data out there with uh, TVAR. And based on, on some of those findings and, and concepts, this was the first real trial looking at uncomplicated type B dissection and comparing optimal medical therapy versus TVAR with optimal medical therapy, and this was the INSTEAD trial. And what's important to note here is that these are not acute dissections. These patients were enrolled two weeks to 52 weeks after their initial dissection, so they're more properly termed a subacute uh, uh, group that was being studied. And the primary endpoint was a two-year endpoint where they were looking at all-cause mortality, but also a variety of secondary endpoints uh, looking at a favorable remodeling, quality of life, uh, et cetera. Now, the disappointing thing to the endovascular enthusiasts in this trial, the TVAR enthusiasts, was that uh, at the primary endpoint at two years, there was no difference in cumulative survival. And in fact, it looked, if you just look at the numbers, that it was a little bit worse in the TVAR group at 91% versus 97%. If you looked at freedom from progression of aortic disease, again, at two years, at that two-year endpoint, uh, no benefit to TVAR, 79% uh, freedom from progressive aortic disease versus 83% optimal medical therapy versus TVAR, and again, that wasn't significant. It is important to note that there were a large number of patients who crossed over, and this is an intention to treat analysis, so there is some effect uh, from that. But what if we look longer than that? So if you look at some of the uh, IRAD data with longer follow-up, it appears that maybe at that longer time point, from two years out to five years, if you follow patients that long, that there may be some benefit to endovascular therapy. They're looking at uh, prevention of progressive uh, aortic enlargement here, so less uh, the aortic diameter is smaller in the patients treated with endovascular therapy, and it looks like maybe out late in the IRAD cohort that there is some improved cumulative survival in the endovascular uh, versus the medical uh, group if you look long term, because again, this is a chronic uh, disease. So they tried to look at this in the uh, INSTEAD cohort, and this was the INSTEAD XL uh, study that was uh, published um, a few years after the original paper. 
There are certainly some flaws, and you can be very critical of this because they used a little uh, statistical sleight of hand with something called landmark analysis, which I'm not smart enough to completely understand. Uh, but what they did show or suggest, if they look at their data, taking it out to five years, that there may actually be benefit from TVAR in terms of reduction in all-cause mortality and aortic-related mortality and prevention of progressive aortic enlargement uh, with the, uh, in the TVAR cohort. Now, if you look specifically after TVAR, there's different behaviors in the stented segment versus the non-stented segment, but there seems to be benefit potentially from both. So if you looked at the uh, data from instead looking at aortic remodeling, it looks like uh, there is benefit in that proximal segment covered with the stent graft in terms of uh, increasing true lumen gain and decreasing false lumen size to a lesser extent, but still statistically significant in the more distal descending thoracic uh, aorta uh, as well. Now, the question arises, like maybe there's some benefit with TVAR. I don't think it's convincing from anything that I've shown you yet, but if there is, which patient should we treat? Clearly, we shouldn't treat everybody because some patients actually do quite well with medical therapy. And uh, I'd like to tell you that TVAR is the greatest thing, and every patient that comes in with a dissection should get a stent graft, and we should call, uh, what is that, 310 uh, aorta fix uh, for uh, get Bill to put in a stent graft. That would be great. But, but the unpleasant truth is that uh, TVAR is not an entirely benign uh, uh, procedure, and there is a certain risk of complications, and we have to balance the risks of medical therapy versus the risks associated with TVAR. If you look at uh, pooled results from reported in the literature of TVAR, now admittedly this includes both un uncomplicated and complicated patients, but there's a significant early mortality with TVAR in the first 30 days of 10% and a significant risk of neurologic complications of stroke and spinal cord ischemia. So for a patient that maybe could be treated medically, we may be doing some patients harm. And if you look at that, uh, those same reports, and admittedly there probably is less complicated patients in these cohorts, but the more early mortality of medical therapy is significantly less than TVAR. So you buy some early upfront mortality risk and complication risk if you're gonna put patients uh, through TVAR. Now, the most feared complication, and we spoke about it a little bit earlier, is uh, creating a retrograde aortic dissection involving the ascending aorta. That can be a, a, a very dangerous event with a 42% mortality. Fortunately, it's relatively low overall in looking at TVAR all comers at 1.3%, but it's much more common when you're treating type B aortic dissections than aneurysms and much more common in the acute phase than the chronic phase. And there was a suggestion in this paper that it was because of proximal bear stents. I'm not sure that that's been totally borne out in some of the subsequent data. Now, if you look just at the uncomplicated cohort undergoing uh, 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 TVAR and you look at early complications and risks of the procedure, this is the INSTEAD data. They had about a 3% mortality. They did have a retrograde aortic dissection in that cohort, and they did have some neurologic complications, albeit relatively low numbers. This is the absorbed uh, uh, trial data, and, and actually there was not much data in this paper. They didn't tell you a lot of stuff in the outcomes. But uh, in these patients with uncomplicated dissections undergoing TVAR with the Gore-Tag device, there was a low uh, mortality and seemingly good outcomes, but it was equally good in the optical medical therapy group too. So I'm not sure we've really shown uh, any benefit. They didn't give us any data on retrograde dissections, hopefully there were zero, or neurologic complications in either cohort. So. If we look at all comers with acute type B aortic dissections, you have to break them down into groups. Clearly we know if a patient is complicated, that patient uh, is gonna need some sort of intervention. But when we're looking at uncomplicated type B aortic dissections, we really have to put, try to see if we can group them into low risk for complications or high risk for complications. The complicated patients, of course, are gonna get TVAR. But if you have a patient who's low risk for complications of their type B dissection, they should continue to be treated medically. The trick is to identify those patients at high risk because those are the, probably the subset that are gonna benefit from TVAR up front. So we've already heard a little bit about this, some of the things that may predict uh, um, poorer outcomes. Uh, the first is gonna be uh, total aortic diameter. If you have an aortic diameter at presentation that's greater than 40 millimeters uh, uh, diameter, uh, those patients do significantly worse. And so in, in patients with aortic diameter greater than four centimeters at presentation, that predicts a, enlargement and aortic events in over 60% of patients uh, with follow-up out here through about uh, five years. Uh, 
The size of the entry tear matters. So if you have an entry tear that's greater than 10 millimeters in diameter, that too is associated with significantly worse cumulative survival if you have a big proximal entry tear. False lumen diameter, so not just the total diameter, but if you have a false lumen diameter at, the, at the, uh, just the end of the aortic arch and the proximal descending thoracic aorta that exceeds 22 millimeters in diameter, that's also a predictor of poor outcomes here, looking at patients with false lumen diameter less than 22 versus false lumen diameter 22 millimeters or more, and looking at cumulative event-free uh, survival in these patients. And finally, this was the subject of a, uh, a New England paper a number of years ago, looking at the degree of thrombosis of the false lumen. And, and total thrombosis is great, that's, that's good, but it actually turns out that having a patent false lumen is better than a partially false, uh, thrombosed uh, false lumen in terms of survival. And so the patients with the, uh, uh, the, the, the greatest number of events were those who had partial false lumen thrombosis versus the other two alternatives. Finally, there's some information that's coming out looking at aortic inflammation. This is based on studies done with uh, FDG uh, PET studies showing that there's increased aortic uh, uh, inflammation associated with partial false lumen thrombosis, so maybe some biological explanation. Those who have expanding false lumen and those who may be at higher risk of rupture have been shown to have uh, increased activity on these FD, uh, uh, FDG PET studies. And importantly, in some of these patients, if you treat them with TVAR, the early inflammation that's seen goes away once they're treated and their aorta heals. So whether it heals with medical therapy or with the stent graft, that probably reflects that there's a decrease in the inflammatory process uh, as well. The other question that comes up is if we identify those patients at high risk, when do we treat them? When should we treat uh, uncomplicated dissection? Should we do it right when they come in the door or should we cool them off for a while? Is there some benefit to that? Well, that risk of retrograde aortic dissection is higher in the acute phase. So this is actually a systemic, uh, systematic review looking at uh, literature, looking at the overall incidence of retrograde aortic dissection. It was 1.6% uh, rather in almost 10,000 patients published in the literature. Again, that high mortality associated with that. This is a bad event. If this happens, there's a good chance your patient's going to die. And the risk was greater in type B dissections in those patients who were treated acutely versus in the chronic phase. So within the first two weeks, that risk of retrograde aortic dissection because of the very fragile and inflamed uh, and uh, intimal uh, flap is much higher in that early acute phase defined as earlier than two weeks. This study is really the only study that I can find that really looked at different time points. This is a virtue registry looking at the valiant stent graft for treatment of type B aortic dissections. These weren't necessarily uncomplicated. There were a number of complicated dissections in this, but they did have patients that were in acute, subacute, and chronic phases. Subacute was defined as 14 to 92 days. The acute phase were two weeks or less, and the chronic ones were uh, dissections that were uh, uh, treated uh, more than 92 days after onset of symptoms. And what you can see here is in the, the subacute group tended to do the best. The acute group tended to do the worst with, in terms of procedural complications. So looking at mortality, stroke and neurologic events, uh, and composite endpoints, much worse in the acute phase than the subacute phase. If you look at uh, freedom from mortality, the patients in the subacute group had a low mortality. That's the red line here. And the patients in the chronic group, that's a green line here, had an increased late mortality over time. So there seemed to be benefit in the subacute group uh, compared to the other two groups in terms of mortality. If you look at aortic remodeling, so the question would be, well, if we wait a few weeks, then maybe we won't get the favorable aortic remodeling that we might have if we treated the patient when, when they're acute, but that's not really true either. So the patients in the subacute group actually remodel like those in the acute group. So if you look out here at uh, three years, I think it is, the uh, acute, uh, which is blue, and in the red, which is a subacute group, both have decrease in false lumen size, but those patients who were treated in the chronic phase have continued ongoing expansion of their false lumen. So again, subacute treatment group remodel like those in the acute group, but the patients in the chronic group have persistent false lumen growth. And if you look at the ability to achieve false lumen thrombosis, uh, at the level of the diaphragm, not just along the stent graft, that was actually greater in the acute and subacute patients, and those patients with chronic dissections, you don't get that distal false lumen uh, thrombosis. So uh, overall, it appears that uh, timing is everything. Uh, 
that uh, deferred treatment is definitely safer than treatment in the acute phase if you're going to treat uncomplicated dissections, and that it does appear to provide the same protection against late uh, dissection-related complications. So if uh, I want to give you kind of an algorithm, uh, and this is still controversial, about uncomplicated acute type B dissections and how we should follow and when we should intervene. Initially, you're going to have your initial scan and your symptoms on presentation, and based on the scan and the anatomic criteria, you're going to determine if your patient is low risk or high risk. Those low-risk patients, you're going to continue to follow with imaging surveillance and continue with optimal medical therapy. Those higher-risk patients, or if a patient converts uh, anatomic features to a high-risk group, you're going to rescan them earlier, and those are the patients that you're going to consider that uh, delayed treatment in the subacute phase. So just to conclude here, uncomplicated type B dissections treated with optimal medical therapy do have a high incidence of late aortic complications, and that we'd certainly like to prevent uh, with TVAR in the appropriate patients. TVAR is still controversial for treatment of uncomplicated type B dissections, and I don't think we have all the data that I can tell you unequivocally that we should be doing this uh, uh, in, in a lot of these patients. Certainly, TVAR does uh, not, approve the er not improve the early outcomes. We've seen that in INSTEAD and the other data, but it may prevent some of these late complications, particularly in the high-risk groups. So we should consider TVAR in good risk patients with that high-risk anatomy for late uh, uh, poor outcomes. And if we're going to do it, do it in the subacute phase. It's safer to do it then than in the acute phase. And with that, I'll stop. Excellent. Um, we're running a little bit late, but we'll take a question or two from the audience. You know, I wanted to ask, um, in, the, in the issue of partial versus total full lumen thrombosis, uh, obviously a patient that, that has a patent false lumen that ends up with a completely thrombosed false lumen goes through a period where it was partially thrombosed. So the question is, uh, is one of timing, and, and so how do, you, how do you decide to do anything if there's partial lumen thrombosis? You know, I, I think that's a good question, and a lot of that data, that was published in 2009, and that was before we were really, you know, before a lot of the other data that I showed you came out. Certainly it's a negative predictor uh, if it's persistent. Uh, partial false lumen thrombosis. But as you mentioned, I mean, this is a spectrum and there's an evolution over time. I've seen patients who came in with IMH and then the next time you scan them, it looks like a dissection. And uh, uh, I think it's that algorithm where you have continued surveillance. And so if you see that that, that, that false lumen continues to thrombose and maybe is going to become totally thrombosed over time, fine. I'd continue to treat them medically. But if you see that, that there are negative features, that it's not thrombosing, that there is some enlargement of the false lumen or there are other negative predictors, then that, those may be the group that need, you need to treat. 